we often times discuss marketing as if we're talking to robots, as if we're just like, here's another playbook that you can implement and 10x your growth. Like we're still in these sort of early 2000s world of like click funnels and there's too many people who are still in that space. I'm Jonathan Gandalf and welcome to the Content Cocktail Hour, powered by The Juice. Our mission is to squeeze out the deepest secrets of B2B marketing professionals to help you push your brand to the forefront of the industry. Let's raise the glass. I'm thrilled to be joined by Luke Frazier, CEO and storyteller at Parable Brands to discuss content marketing. Is it genuine? Is it authentic? Is it inauthentic? What has it been and where is it going? Lots to cover today. I'm excited to do it with Luke. Luke, We're big fans of yours. Thanks for being here. The reason you're here is because you present kind of a unique lens on what I would say is traditional B2B content. And we'll dig into all of that. But before we do that today, just A, thank you for being here. B, maybe in your own words, you want to share a little bit about your journey and what you're up to nowadays? Thrilled to be juicing with you, my friend, today. I love doing these kind of conversations because Parable was born out of a desire to tell stories about 10 or 12 years ago. I I started in the world of podcasting, actually having no idea where I wanted to go with it, coming from kind of a psychology marketing background. And sure enough, when you interview hundreds of entrepreneurs and creatives, you begin to become an entrepreneur and creative. And so it was born out of that. And now we are a brand strategy and content agency, helping companies tell their story and clarifying messages so that we can reach the people that we want to connect with. That's awesome. It's like podcast entrepreneur osmosis. You just do it enough and you become one of them. I like it. I think so. I think that's the equation. I'm not old enough to know quite yet, I think. But sure enough, this past decade, that's where we've been. You just, you hang around it enough, you become. Yes, exactly. Well, this is the content cocktail hour and we always like to ask all of our guests, what are they enjoying drinking nowadays? I currently have with me my second coffee of the day. It is a very small iced Americano. You'll find me drinking black coffee, I guess Americanos, or maybe, maybe a whiskey if the time presents itself, but probably mostly water. 95% 95 of the time it's water. I love it. Yeah, I'm a few coffees behind you and then hydrating up for a plane ride later today, but love the cold brew, love the espresso. Very good. Well, let's jump in to today's main course, if you will, around content. I feel awkward saying this maybe a little bit, but the first time I met you, it was because you were on video inside of Asana. We'll let the uh, audience marinate on that a little bit. But in all seriousness, your content caught my attention for the first time because you were literally recording yourself inside of Asana, providing some hot takes, if you will, pun intended. Tell us about the Asana series, how it came to be, what you're learning from it, and just give us the lowdown on, on this content. It is a very funny ride. The reason behind the series was merely out of practicality. My wife and I have a nine-month-old. We have a very busy household, dogs and animals and people coming through all the time. And oftentimes my office space is, we'll just say it's not very quiet often. And so we have a sauna outside. It was funny because I was fed up with both the world of inauthentic marketing as well as the noise in my house. And that burst this sauna. I thought to myself, you know what? I'm going to go take meetings in the sauna because it's actually probably going to be nice and packaged in. It's actually going to, this sound quality is fine as long as I have a mic, but the lighting, get natural lighting. It's great. And and it's blocked out. No one can hear it. But then while I was in this sauna, I started having these wild ideas around just different hot takes. And, you know, I follow tons of other marketers and CMOs and entrepreneurs and just looking at the market and what people want, especially in the B2B space versus what they don't want. And you hear everybody has an opinion about it nowadays. And so I really just wanted to speak to reality of like, we often times discuss marketing as if we're talking to robots, as if we're just like, here's another playbook that you can implement and 10x your growth. Like we're still in these sort of early 2000s world of like click funnels. And there's too many people who are still in that space of mass, mass generation and marketing. And so I was fired up about this. <laughs> I don't even remember what the first topic was. We'd have to go back and look at it. It'd be funny. But, and I just started filming and it was a joke early on. Like, I did not intend to do multiple 
episodes of these little shorts and they were mostly intended for LinkedIn. I, I tried Instagram, but it doesn't actually land as well there because my audience is all B2B. And I'm a one take kind of wonder. Like I get in there, I have an idea and I just go and I don't care how it looks or sounds or it feels. I iterate along the way and get, hopefully it gets better. Sometimes it doesn't, who cares? And I remember trying to figure out a tagline as a joke. And the tagline is that the content is hotter than the sauna, which, you know, it's kind of redundant or obvious. And modern day Don Draper. I thought, yeah, I thought to myself, you know what? This is so stupid. It might work. The thing about it is people started getting up in arms about is the sauna on or not on? Or thank God we see him again in a sauna. Like, oh, I've been looking for this next. Like, it's not like there's millions of people looking at it, but there's enough. Like there's enough fan base that I thought to myself, you know what, I could be consistent with this. And sure enough, like people now look for it or they appreciate it more. And I only do about three of them a week to not kind of, you know, saturate the market. And, and I don't know if it'll keep going next week. It's just a week by week thing at this point, but it's a fun little twist on like, Hey, I'm not in a common office setting breaks the wall of like, you know, marketing jargon. And then we talk about things that are real and hopefully it leaves value. Sometimes it maybe is just more silly than, than actually valuable. But it also speaks to the fact, I just saw a little note of Ryan Reynolds kind of speaking to like getting back to more of the authenticity of and the fun of like advertising. And I, and I do feel like we are robotizing. We are, we are leaning too much on artificial intelligence to be our creative. And so... Part of this movement for me is more speaking back to like, hey, I want to build a brand that is actually fun and engaging and speaks to the people behind brand and beyond. And so here we are now, we film in Asana because who knows why it's fun. And it's one of those things that like I hold loosely too. And I think this is a good thing for other marketers, like try stuff, iterate it, try it from different angles, try it with different people, try it with episodes, try it in, we, you know, we might do some interviews in it later. Like just try a bunch of different ways, look at the data and then see if it continues to work. And so that's really how we look to support our brands as well. That's incredible. I love the like inauthenticity of some of what we see in B2B marketing. And I think you are so right that it's because we've, we've tried to like overly playbook what we're doing and just thinking inputs and outputs. You know, we talk a lot about it, the juice, the, the rise of inbound marketing and, and gated content. You know, that became a playbook when it was novel and not everybody was doing it. It worked, you know, whether or not it was the right way to be going about it, it worked. Then everybody started doing it and people learned the game it be, all becomes white noise and it just stops working. It becomes very inauthentic that people stopped caring about the content they were actually gating and all they cared about was the conversion. And that's obviously as inauthentic as it gets. And that's the tough thing about marketing is that it's, especially when we throw in startup and venture capitalists in the past 30 years, everything has to be backed by data, which I know you are a data nerd. You love data. That's why the juice is the juice. But if it's the only thing we're worried about, then we can lose creative. And the thing about creative is that it's the thing that speaks to people. As much as data to back things up is very good, and I hope people are utilizing their data to make better content, it can be the death of a brand as well. Because we're losing out on the people element. We're in such an AI, inauthentic, gated, now world and environment. Maybe this was, you know, had a touch from COVID, had a touch from just innovation and, and evolution, had a touch from technology, but we've lost the sense of like human in creative and we've lost the sense of human in brand. And so now we do see more brands, you know, getting back involved with engaged in events and and give backs and promotions that don't just promote their brand, but it promotes their believers and their community. And so I think we're seeing a push toward it, but this is also just a call to action for other agencies, other marketers to like lean into the hundred to a thousand avid fans that you have and serve them so, so well, serve them with everything you have because outside of those hundred to a thousand people, it doesn't really matter what people think of you because no one else really cares unless 
you as a brand can, I'm laughing at this believe poster from Ted Lasso behind you, but because I want to say, unless you can make them believe that what you offer, even in B2B is going to make them better. Because if we're really honest, all we're marketing to is other B2B professionals who have something at stake. And for usually for them, it's their job or it's a promotion or it's a career. And so they're buying from your service in B2B because they think it's going to make them look better. If we break it all down, right? Like truthfully, now hopefully your service does something and maybe there's analytics in there. But like if you can work with that human and, and gain interest and gain collaboration and relationship, you're probably better off long term with that person, no matter what company they go to, than you are had you just sold to them and, you know, had your marketing just be kind of an extra, you know, AE in your sort of repertoire, if that makes sense. Yeah, it does make sense. I think you're right about like this, all these playbooks we're running, AI, and like th- this era of like everything needs to be efficient, right? But I think so much of what stands out is like pattern interruption, right? Because everything in our lives has been like driven into this pattern where we're, we're scrolling and just seeing. And I think that's why your content stands out of you in a song. That's certainly not a pattern we see elsewhere. And I think in B2B, unfortunately, as you mentioned the Ryan Reynolds point, like fun is a pattern interruption. That's that's honestly, that's why we chose the name The Juice on our side is because we wanted people to ask us like, why are you called The Juice? And like, the truth is there's not a great reason. You could say, you know, more juice, less squeeze, which 50% of the time I say backwards, I say more squeeze, less juice, and I get it wrong anyway. But I think there's something to be said for B2B. Like we've overly playbooked everything and now it's just about this pattern interruption. But let me lob this back over the fence at you. There's also the reality of a lot of people creating the content in B2B don't have the license to make creative decisions the way they probably should or would desire. So what's the space between somebody publishing, you know, a traditional ebook and somebody jumping in Asana? Or do you really need to push it to the extreme to really stand out? Like what is the space between and how do you encourage brands to explore that space? It is tough. This is not a game where you necessarily could just be like someone like me or, you know, like <laughs> The sauna wins or fails, like it's my loss. It's not, it's no one else's, right? It's our, it's, it's my company's loss. And so I can make those decisions. I can take those risks. But if you are, you know, a CMO and you're having to report to a CEO or having to report to a board that is funding every decision you make, well, you're going to have a harder time. And so there is tension because your data needs to be ROI. Did this marketing return anything? And, and you have to be able to prove that. And that's why we see such a high turnover with CMOs nowadays in tech and B2B space. And it, and it kind of sucks, right? Because you have six months to two years to figure out if you're going to make it as a CMO nowadays, typically, right? That's it's kind of about the, the 10 year. And just had a Nick Gaudio on our podcast who used to be CMO over at Rattle and he's, he's now moved to the company, I, I, I forget the name of the company, but actually one of the things that he said was he was the guy, he was that guy having to push creative forward, push content forward in a company that was kind of stuck in the stone ages of how they created. And the first few times he put out stuff that was a little edgy, he you know got a slap on the wrist for it. But he just had tough skin. What he said to me about this kind of same question was like, you as a marketer just have to get keep going because most likely you are boots on the ground. You know what people, what buyers, what friends, what families, you know what's going on in the market. And oftentimes, hate to say it, your C-suite doesn't or your board just doesn't. They're just dumping money in and they, like, they don't even care. They don't even care what's happening down here. They just want to see the bottom or top line. And so there is like this tension as marketers where you do just, you kind of have to fight. (laughs) You got to fight. We have to be the ones to fight for it and fight back within our companies and and push because it won't change if we don't. I hate to say that because it feels like an it depends answer, which like sucks to hear in marketing. But if you as a marketer really believe in it, then you will fight for it or you'll get it. You'll find a new employer that cares and will back you up. But the other thing about it is like (laughs) Nick was saying, he just like, he waited till his boss was out of town and did something that was edgy. 
but then had the data to back it up after it showed, right? Like people found it entertaining and you're right. And so there is this line of like, you kind of have to prove your worth. Like you can't just go in as a brand new CMO or low level marketer and be like, yo, I saw this, you know, article on the juice where they said we could, you know, do this kind of stuff and it's more edutainment now and we could go do it. And you just wing it without any clear strategy or backing or like goals. If you can't prove yourself, I mean, one, you should probably learn how to become a value driven professional, but two, I think that's the route. And so I guess to blanket this whole statement is I would say, Hey, if you know, you're going to get pushed back, come to your boss or whoever it is, or in your board and say, Hey, this is what we plan to do. Here's why we're going to do it. Here are the results we're going after. And here's like, and here's the data we will show and prove when we're done. Here's the timeline it will take. And hopefully if you can present it in such a way and you have a good company and a good boss and a, and a good team, you will be able to push things forward. But I also will say in all this, not every piece of content has to be edgy or fun in that way. There's also this kind of stance of like, you also, you know, you need to educate your buyers or you need to like niche into what they're talking about. And so sometimes those buyers aren't always the like fun and exciting people. They, they just need to see how your product better serves than someone else. And so there are different ways to, to kind of skin this cat. It just, it really does depend like the service that you're providing and who you're talking to. But I do think in general, I would say fight, like fight for what you believe in, but also know how to back it up. Do know the data that backs it up. And I think that's important. Yeah, too. there's a foundation that has to be built and earned, I think, in order to place some bets. And I think the better you know your foundation, the easier it is to build on top of that. I also think like you mentioned the like, you know, tough skin. And I think if you're, marketing's supposed to be fun. If you're not having fun, you're probably not being creative. And if you're comfortable, you're probably not being super creative either, right? Like it's some combination, like get a little uncomfortable, have some fun and, you know, see what happens. I think that's just so important. I, I think like, again, like, we're in marketing. Like this isn't rocket surgery. Yeah. You're, this isn't life or life or death. So please have fun with it. And if you don't have a bunch of fails in your marketing record, you probably haven't tried enough. If it's only wins, I'd be very cautious to like see what you are really pushing the gamut on. Because I do think like people might see the sauna thing now, but I've been doing this stuff for 10 years and I, there've been years where no one cared. You just have to put the reps in to find something that works, but then be willing to iterate and adjust and shift when you realize, yeah, that was crap. I don't really care, John, like if it's the sauna or if it's a cold plunge or if it's me in a boardroom, I'm going to still be putting out the same stuff. It doesn't matter the avenue. It doesn't matter the iterations. And so I think that's also the tough skin that I like to like put on is like, you're going to get Luke no matter what, no matter what I'm doing or wearing or where I am, you're going to get me and it's going to be excited and passionate, but I also might be empathetic with you. I'm very firm in my identity as a human being. And I know that, you know? And so I think that's also just an important thing. There is this a little bit of in the brand space in content space. Like if you can know yourself and be okay with failing, then you can actually create better content and uh, drive your company's brand forward because you're creating a culture that says we want you to be involved in this. You know, I want other team members to be involved in this as they are, which gets into a little bit of a, like this, like touchy feely emotional side. And I was kind of preaching this to you earlier, but if we want to build better, healthier cultures and these amazing brands that don't blow up, like we work in Uber, then we also need to kind of uphold those values and help as, as C-level suite executives, C-suite level executives help kind of cultivate a space where people can be themselves and be creative and not just have to always come back with an ROI that's like, yeah, we made this much money this weekend. Because there are some metrics in marketing that don't directly attribute, you know, connection. But again, a guy, a, seriously, a guy named like uh, Nick Gaudio is someone everyone should be following because he is brilliant at like going out and going, doing like these crazy marketing stunts, but then backing it up and saying, well, I know this piece of content brought in this business. Like he will find that. You got to be a little shifty. You got to be a little rebellious in the way you go about it. To me, there are too many creatives sitting on their hands because they're worried about what people will think. So how does a brand go from 
this traditional culture of putting MQLs on a slide for the boardroom to more creative, more storytelling, more fun. What's the step there? Maybe I'm re-asking a similar question in a different way, but what should somebody listening to this do? Just start trying, throw things out there and see what happens? Yeah, I mean, I always would, we were just talking with a guy who wants to grow his business's YouTube channel and thought, hey, that's a great move. You know, a lot of good can come out of that podcast. And he was asking about all of these metrics And things like, you know, he was talking about sponsorships and guests and collaboration and cross promotion and distribution and creative analysis. And a lot of them were things that like, these are good things that determine and help support MQLs and help support leads. And we got to understand all these metrics, but he also is starting from zero. And so on one hand, it's like, yeah, just start getting stuff out there because we have to build up a content foundation because you're not going to go viral tomorrow. I'm sorry. It's not the world we live in anymore. And if your goal is to go viral, then see you later. I'm going to work with someone else because there is no marketer out there. I don't think that, and this might be a little hot or not topic right here, but like, I actually don't think anyone should be trying to attain virality anymore. That's a losing game. It's like trying to play in the masters. Every single one of those golfers loses except one. The odds of being that one are redonkulous. I mean, I don't know if anyone listens to watches golf here, but Tiger just finished 60th and everyone thought he was the biggest thing in the world. What I would say is step back for a moment, look at the market, look what's happening and build strategy first. So A, market research, where are your buyers? Because you might create a content strategy that nobody cares about, but it's funny and it performs well, but your buyers aren't around because it's not in the right place. So A, where are your buyers? Where are they Are they in some Reddit platform? Are they at events? Are they in person? Are they on LinkedIn? Are they on you? Like, where are they going to be most of the time? What else are they looking into? Get as much research as you can. And then out of that place, build kind of a strategy framework. Although my sauna efforts might seem a little bit like Luke threw this in the wind and It all came from a strategy for our business to be like this authentic brand of helping brands kind of get their message out of this desert of confusion because everybody is in this stupid desert thinking, I have to do this and I have to do a podcast and I have to do TikTok and I have to like, and we're just doing it because everybody else says do it. And I want to get people into a space of clarity of knowing who they are and strategically. And so it actually, my stuff always is going to fit into that framework, even if you see me market testing this content sauna. And so because that's where my buyers are on LinkedIn and they want disruption. They want differentiation, right? And so that's why it fits for us. And so anyway, market research, begin also in your brand strategy. Like does doing this content idea that I have, does it align with who we are as a company? Mission, vision, values. Because if it doesn't, then you probably, that's your answer. You don't need to go to your boss. That's your answer right there. Just don't do it. But next, you know, does it align with our buyer? Does it align with our ICP? And then if that is all true, Then just look at the distribution channels and begin to create that stuff there. And then iterate in that space. Don't iterate. That strategy is tactical data that you should start from and use as a filter of decision-making processes. Then iterate the creative beyond it and go with it. And so I always, even though I'm, I'm heavy on the crazy creative or fun creative or whatever, I am going to be bullish on brand and strategy behind it. And most of our clients, we spend... 30 to 90 days building out strategy before we even touch creative because we need to know every bit of data and research and ICP. We have customer interviews with current customers before we even dive into those things so that we know this risk is worth taking. And so please start in strategy. And if your company doesn't already have clarified mission, vision, values, and core values, go ask your freaking CEO, board, boss, whatever to clarify them for you or you help them clarify or bring someone else in to do that because decisions outside of that are never going to be on brand. And that's what's going to hurt your reputation if you're just throwing stuff at the wind and it's outside of your brand reputation. It's fascinating that like there was process to you ending up in the sauna, actually. Like it sounds like this crazy off the wall idea and it is, but like it's the famous like constraints can breed creativity, right? Like you have these constraints in place that were 
your authenticity, the story you wanted to tell, the strategy, the channel, then it's like, okay, well, there's only so many variables within this. And sure enough, you found the additional variables of needing silence and needing authenticity. And sure enough, the Venn diagram of those two things landed you in the sauna. So, all right, you mentioned that was an unpopular opinion, although a good one, I think. We do always end our podcast episodes with asking our guests, what is one unpopular opinion that you hold in the B2B marketing space? Yeah, man, to be honest, I've been trying to think about this this whole time. (laughs) Put you on the spot. I think one area that I probably maybe differ from other markers, but I I don't think other, I'd imagine other creatives agree with this, but the hot take that honestly is coming to mind in my brain right now is that silence is okay. And I mean a couple of different things by that. One, your brand doesn't always have to be talking. As much as we live in this content distribution age and virality, your brand doesn't always have to be doing the talking. Oftentimes, you can stick out more if your brand is positioned to listen to your customers. So that's one side of it. The other side of it is actually when you are listening to your customers, don't do any of the talking. The worst thing we can do as brands is tell our customers or our users or our prospects how they should think, feel, and act. And so I think, to be honest, the idea of a content sauna, what's hot, what's not, hot takes, like it kind of plays off of this in a way. But there are too many marketers that are we see on LinkedIn all day long. And you know, you and I both do it sort of tongue in cheek. We were like, marketing should be X, Y, or Z. Like it should be this way, or a brand should be this way. And oftentimes I think like as much as we're joking or maybe we are staying in our beliefs, we forget about the other side of the market or the other side of different industry that's like just doesn't work with my industry, doesn't work with my buyer. And so anyway, I think silence is key because we often want to talk a lot and we I mean, I want to talk a lot. I I see a lot in the market, but we can also trip over ourselves too often and almost become hypocritical. And I do this all the time where, you know, I say one thing one week and then I look at the market and then a totally different thing happens the next week. And so I say a different thing, which is fine. Like, I don't mind being hypocritical of myself. Like, it's okay. We're not going to lose ROI if we're spending more time listening to our customers than trying to create content that they hear in a crowded market. And so I do think it's okay as a marketer, if you're coming into a new industry or a new service, or you're making a shift or you notice a shift, spend 30 days listening to your customer or your salespeople or your customer service reps before creating, because you might actually learn a thing or two. And so there you go. That's a warm take. It's like a warm, (laughs) warm take. A bit ironic, if nothing else, to be quiet and listen on our podcast. So yeah, I love it. All right, last question. If people want to learn more about you or Parable, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, you can, most of it, you'll hear me blabbering on, on LinkedIn. You can follow there, just Luke Frazier. You can go to our site too, parablestory.com. We have a podcast you can find Jonathan actually in a couple of weeks on there called The Promised Brand you can tune in there. So those are a couple different areas that you can get connected and call me hypocrite whenever you want. (laughs) I love it. Well, Luke, thank you so much for joining the content cocktail hour. Everybody go check out Luke on LinkedIn, go check out parable. We'll see you next time. Same time, same place. Cheers. Thank you for joining the content cocktail hour powered by the juice. If you want to see more episodes or more resources, Curated for your role, join us on app.thejuicehq.com. See you next time. Same time, same place. Cheers.